Good morning. It'd be fantastic if you could get a Bible in front of you, uh, in your families, have a like, real physical Bible, and open it up at 1 Peter, the letter that Peter wrote to churches that were scattered uh, through various areas that are now Turkey. And uh, we're going to look at chapter 1 and verses uh, 13 through to 16, uh, which we're going to read in just a moment, or someone's going to read it for us, uh, the various verses. But 13 to 16 is what we're looking at. But just to remind you the kind of big picture, Peter is, has been praising God for all the good things that he's done. So I'm going to read verse uh, 3 and just down a little bit. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, in his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. That's a great thing to praise God for. We're going to pray now and praise God and ask him to help us. Lord God, we thank you for your salvation. We thank you for the inheritance we thank you for what we have to look forward to in the new heavens and the new earth. And we pray that you would encourage us this morning to live well because of all that you have done for us. And we pray this for your name and for your glory. Amen. So we're looking at verses 13 through to 16. Have a look down at them just to see. It's a little paragraph there. And Peter, who wrote this letter, is applying... The things that he said so far in his letter, he's sort of connecting them with their lives. He's saying, this is all true, and so this is what you need to do. And he starts to do it in what we look at this week, and then he goes on to say some other things. They all come out of this amazing salvation that God has shown to his people. So just to remind you, Peter has said, God has showed great mercy to give us a living hope, an inheritance. That means something that we will get when we get to the new heaven and the new earth. We didn't earn it, we just get it. And also, God protects us right now through life. And so Peter has said that you can rejoice, even though sometimes things are quite hard. Through rejoicing, you can bring glory to God. And also you can rejoice and praise God because you have this loving relationship with Jesus. Even though you can't see him, you trust in him and you love him. And you know what? You're living in the last days, the best days, when God has fully revealed his plan of salvation. So it's a great time to live. It's a time that even angels are, are looking into and seeing what God's doing. Although sometimes it might feel a bit hard, you are in the best days and you are working towards the end of all things. And so then Peter says, because this is all true, then we need to live in a way that pleases God, set apart from God. We need to be different. That doesn't mean that Christians are weird. For those of you who are at school or at college or are able to go to work at this time, it doesn't mean you're strange in the sense of behaving not like a human being, but it does mean that you will be different. Not the same in what you're looking forward to. Not the same in how you want to act. And we're going to think about that from uh, these verses. <clears throat> the first thing uh, we can see from these verses is be hopeful. Be hopeful. And someone's going to read verse 13 for us. This is 1 Peter, chapter 1, verse 13. Therefore... With minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. Thank you. If we're following Jesus, if we love Jesus, if we're saved by Jesus, if we said, Lord God, please forgive my sin and come into my life, please show me mercy, if we've said that and we're wanting to follow Jesus, it will change the way we think and, of course, what we do. And Peter begins by saying, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ 
is revealed. He says, set your minds on the hope. And that expression, be alert and fully sober, it's a slightly strange phrase, which is why they've changed slightly the words that are used. It's something like, gird up the loins of your mind. And it's connected with what they would do in those days in terms of wearing big robes. And if you're wearing a robe, it's quite awkward to run. But if you gather it all up and sort of tuck it all in and, and uh, make it all nice and neat, then it's much easier to run. And we've got a little video just to, to illustrate that coming on just now. You see, when you, when you gather up all, the, all your robe around you, if you're wearing a robe in those days, then it was so much easier to run, as uh, Roxy and Vivian uh, illustrated for us so well. So much easier to run. If you've got a big dressing gown on or some big clothes on, a big raincoat on, it's much harder to run, isn't it? And what Peter is saying, it's a bit like that with your minds. You gather your minds up and you collect all your, your, your clothes in your mind and all the baggage and sort of collect it all up so you're nice and neat, so you can really run towards heaven. That's what he's really saying. Get ready to run towards heaven. Set your hope, set your direction. Go towards heaven. Really think about it. He says, minds that are alert and fully sober. <clears throat> and of course, sober sometimes means not drunk, not having drunk so much alcohol that you can't think straight and you can't control what you do. Did you know that uh, during lockdown, alcohol sales are up by 30%? It's partly because people are at home more, but maybe in some cases, it's partly because people want to just take away the, the thoughts of, of what's happening with their lives at the moment. And Christians should never want or need to drink to get rid of their feelings or to drink a lot just for entertainment or to have a sense of well-being or to lose the sort of sense of being afraid of doing certain things. So Peter is saying you shouldn't be drunk with alcohol or drugs or anything else. But actually, he's using it to describe a whole way of thinking where it doesn't so much mean sober from not drinking too much, but it means don't lose spiritual concentration and self-control. Don't have distracted, undisciplined minds. Have your mind really fit and really thinking clearly. And then connect that with your habits. Don't be out of control with all your habits. That means the things that you do regularly. The things that you think about. The way that you respond. Whether you're angry. Whether you're impatient. Whether you don't tell the truth. All those things that show that you've, you've let your mind get out of control. That you're thinking of the wrong things. He says, no. Sort your mind out. Think really clearly. Concentrate on all that Jesus has done and concentrate on what will happen in the future. See the way that verse ends. The grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. So Peter's saying, because of all that God has done in Jesus and because it's going to be amazing in the future, then you will think carefully now about how you live. We know for sure that Jesus is coming back. And that's our hope. And when the Bible uses hope, it's not like our kind of hope. I hope we might be able to meet again as a church maybe in the autumn. But I don't know, and I'm certainly not certain about it. I hope for a really nice new pair of trainers for my birthday in August, if you'd like to buy them for me. But I don't know that's going to happen. But when the Bible says hope, it's saying something which is certain. It is something that we look forward to that hasn't happened yet. But it's something that's absolutely certain. And so as Christians, we are absolutely certain, we hope, 
that Jesus will return, and when he returns, it will be amazing. And it's going to be a great end to the story, and it's going to be a happy time. Just imagine that thing that I was talking about just now. Imagine the time when you will be able to go and visit your wider family, your grandparents or uncles and aunties or other friends and so on. Imagine the time in the future when we will be able to meet together as a church again. How exciting that will be. Now, we can't hope knowing that that definitely is going to happen or it's definitely going to happen at a particular time. But it will be great. We know it will be great. It will be so exciting. It will feel like such a gift, won't it, when we can meet together either here or up at the school and and be together again and sing God's praises all together. That will be something to really look forward to now, won't it? But you know what? Jesus coming back is more certain than that and it will be better than that. So think about how excited you might be about being able to visit friends and come to church. And think about how much more exciting it is that you will be in the presence of God and in the presence of God's people. And all the rubbish things that have made life difficult will have gone away completely. Are you setting your minds? Are you thinking, I'm going to set my direction towards the new heavens and the new earth. I'm going to think carefully about what I do because Jesus is coming back. Take the time to train your mind. You see, it's very easy to get distracted by watching television, by all the cares and the troubles of being in lockdown, by thinking about new clothes or decorating or gardening or or anything or just intoxication with life. It's very easy to get distracted with those things. Many of those are really good things that God gives us to enjoy, but all the time, We've got our minds plugged in, so we're thinking carefully, where is this heading? We're going to be with Jesus. So that's the first thing. I look forward to Jesus coming back now, and I think about what it means for my life. So I look forward to Jesus coming back. Now I'm looking forward to it, and I think about what it means for my life. So that's the first point. Be hopeful. And the second one is be holy. Someone's going to kindly read the uh, next couple of three verses, in fact, for us. This is 1 Peter, chapter 1, verses 14 to 16. As obedient children, do not conform the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he called you as holy, so be holy in all that you do, for it is written, Be holy, because I am holy. Thank you. Sometimes, as children, you might be out walking. Perhaps because of lockdown, you've been out walking even more, and uh, you get near a big, dirty, muddy puddle. And somebody, maybe your parents, or maybe your brother or sister, tell you you really shouldn't go in that dirty puddle and get dirty. And you can choose whether you obey them and keep yourself clean, or whether you get dirty. And we've just got a little video to illustrate that with uh, somebody who decides that he's going to run in the puddle even though he's told not to, and he gets very dirty. Can I just say about this video that, uh, that no washing machines or children were damaged in the making of this video? Although it looks rather uh, underwhelming in many ways, apparently the stench from uh, that child having (laughs) having gone in that puddle uh, was was quite noticeable and uh, and washing machines were required and baths uh, straight afterwards. And so it's like that in life that what Peter is saying is, as an obedient child, don't get yourself dirty in the dirty puddle, but try and keep yourselves pure. We don't do this so God loves us. God's already shown that he loves us, but we do it because we love God. Peter's already said you love Jesus even though you haven't seen him. And because we love Jesus, we want to try and keep ourselves clean. We will sometimes make mistakes and we will run through muddy puddles and we need God's mercy, but we will try. 
Because that's our new goal, is to please God because of his great mercy for us. We want to live as obedient children. And we want to listen to all that God says, and we want to copy God. So we're going to play a little game that I'd love you to play at home. And Mark's going to play it here as well, because Mark loves playing games. And so Mark's going to stand up and help me with this. It's the game Simple Simon. I'm sure you've all heard of it. And what I'm going to do is say, Simon says, sorry, it's called, not called Simple Simon at all, it's called Simon Says. Uh, it's me that's being simple. Uh, Simon Says, and then I'll say something like, uh, Simon Says, pat your head. And so at home, you're supposed to be patting your head. But then if I, if I don't say Simon Says, and I just say, pat your head, then you're not supposed to be. And Mark, as an obedient child, is going to obey all of the instructions perfectly. When Simon says to do it, he's going to do it. And when Simon doesn't say, just me saying, he's not going to do it. So if you watch me, but watch Mark as well. And let's just see if he's being obedient in this. So here we go. Simon says, jump. Simon says, touch your head. Simon says, turn around. Do star jumps. Is Mark doing what Simon is saying? Let's do a few more. Simon says, stick your tongue out. Simon says, put your right arm up. Put your left arm up. I don't think Mark is being obedient. I don't think Mark is copying me. Do you think he's copying me? I think Mark's having fun, which is all right when it's only Simon, but it's more important when it's God. Let's just do one more just so you can see what's happening. Simon says, close your eyes. Simon says, scratch your nose. Stroke your chin. Now, let's see if Mark can disobey this one. Simon says, smile. Oh, dear. Well, Mark's going to have to sit down now. You see what Mark was doing? He was, he was not being like an obedient child. When I said things, he didn't obey me, and he didn't want to copy me. And what Peter says to the Christians he's writing to, verse 14, he says, as obedient children... Do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. He says, what you need to be is like an obedient child who does what his father says. Who is our father? Our father is God in heaven. And our father God has told us many things to do to please him. And Peter says, we want to be like obedient children of our father who does what he asks us to do. And he says, it's not like perhaps the people who are all around us, some of our friends at school or our friends at work or our neighbors. He says, don't be conformed to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. What he means is, don't follow the pattern of the people who are around you who don't love Jesus. You see, Mark wasn't following what I was doing. In a way, he was following what perhaps people around us might do, which is say, well, I don't want to do what this person tells me to do. I'm going to do what I want to do. And Peter says, you used to be like that. Before Jesus came into your life, you used to be just like that. You did just what you wanted to do. If you wanted something, if you could get it, you grabbed it. That was your desire. And sometimes it was for good things, but a lot of times it was for bad things. That's what the world is like all around us. And he says, don't be like that. Don't model yourself. Don't follow all the people around you, but be like God. And so he ends that by saying, but just as he who calls you is holy, be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. Peter is doing is taking part of the Old Testament, the first part of the Bible, the book of Leviticus, where God says to his people, because I am pure, because I can't tolerate sin, I can't put up with sin, 
because I am utterly good and because I'm separate from all of my creation, be like me. Now, Peter is not saying, and God is not saying, you need to be absolutely perfect. That's why Jesus came to make us pure and holy and perfect. But he does mean, with all that we have and with our minds really concentrated, we try and be separate and holy and different. We try not to be the child that runs in the muddy puddle. Of course, God forgives us, like we forgive our children when they do silly things. But we don't want to be those people because we're thinking we're on our way to heaven. So he says, be holy like God is holy. Be different from the people around you at school. Be different from the people around you where you live. Be different from the people around you where you work. Be different from perhaps some people in your family. They may do many good things, but the direction of their life is not going towards being with Jesus. So often they will follow the desires of their hearts, which are not always good. And you need to be different and say, I'm following the King, Jesus, and I want to be like God, separate, pure, not in the muddy puddle. God is perfect. God is pure love. God doesn't tolerate sin. And we want to be like that. And obeying him means learning what he's got to say to us and living what he tells us to do. Learning what he's got to say to us means we look at the Bible. We do that in our families. We do that with some of the children's clubs, uh, even the ones, that we're, the ones that we're even keeping going uh, during this time of lockdown. Uh, we do that when we, when we gather like on a Sunday and uh, listen to God's word, and we can read it ourselves. And we, we learn from the Bible what it means to be an obedient child, what it means to be holy. And then we set our minds to thinking, how can I please God? Because the, the direction of my life is towards heaven. And so I'm going to try and all that I do, I'm going to try and stop being angry and stop telling lies and stop wanting things that don't belong to me and stop worshipping things that are not God. And I know God will forgive me because he loves me, but I really want to please him and I really want to be pure. And so I'm going to think hard about it and I am going to try hard because that's what God wants me to do. Peter says, be holy in all you do. I think about my life at home and I want to be holy. And I think about my life when I'm walking down the street and I want to be holy. And I think about my life when I go to school and I want to be holy. And I think about it at work and I want to be holy. And I think about it when I'm tired and hangry and I want to be holy. Because I want to be holy in all that I do. I want to be like God. I want to obey him as my loving father. That's what this section is about. I want to be like God. I want to obey him as my loving father. And we need God's help to do that. So I'm going to pray now before we sing. Let's pray. Lord God, we praise you that you have given us new birth and living hope. And so we are going somewhere in our lives. We're going to be with you. And we pray for help to be holy as we're on our way. We pray that we might think hard how we please you. That we might set the direction of our lives towards the great things that will happen when we meet with you in the future. And because of that, we might think about all our actions right now. Lord, please help us to do that. Help us to be very quick to say sorry to you when we've stepped in the puddle, when we've disobeyed you. Help us to try and avoid those things that we know don't please you. Help us to be sober-minded, not distracted, not trying to take away the, the thoughts that are good and pure and helpful. Lord, help us to be real with ourselves and real with you and to please you in what we do. We need your help to do this and we pray for your ongoing mercy helping us to live holy lives, alert, sober-minded, 
fully set on the hope to be revealed. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.